So welcome everyone to our lecture today. We have some uh, lay, some latecomers. Thank you. Nice to have you here, Amanda. So today we're going to be talking about ten lesser known contemporary outbreaks. Exactly. So um, these are ten outbreaks that maybe you all have heard very little about, or maybe have not heard about at all. We're going to count from ten to one. Each presentation will be um, started by a question, and whoever gets the question correct gets candy. But let's just talk a little bit more about lesser-known ID outbreaks. Many outbreaks are regional, and they escape attention outside of their geographic locality until they become more widespread. An example of that would be Zika virus, right? Smaller outbreaks lack media focus. Um, many of you may not remember, but um, there was a discussion for months about Ebola virus in Africa before it actually uh, affected um, U.S. personnel, and we started talking about it. And a lot of outbreaks lack a celebrity champion. So who would be an example of a celebrity champion? Um, let's say pres a former President Carter, who uh, has been a big champion of onchocerciasis and raised a profile of onchocerciasis. A lot of outbreaks don't really have that. Um, now, there are specific resources available to keep us informed about new or emerging outbreaks, such as ProMedMail, Emerging Infectious Disease Journal, Twitter, and so forth. Um, social media is a great way to, if you subscribe to the right people, you can learn about uh, in, uh, lesser known ID outbreaks. Okay, so here's our, our first question. Number 10, this flavivirus causes a regional encephalitis that can rapidly lead to coma and death. Is it A, dengue, B, Powassan virus, C, West Nile virus, D, yellow fever, or E, Zika virus? Okay, let's answer. Put your answers together. And let's see what our answer, hold up your answers. How many people said C? Okay, so I see uh, C, 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 and what did you put? D? Okay. Amanda? C. Everybody is picking West Nile virus. Let's see what the correct answer. The correct answer is actually B, Powassan virus. Everybody missed it. Okay, so Powassan virus, named after the town of Powassan, Ontario, first discovered in 1958. Normally transmitted between wildlife and the wild. That's a little redundant, sorry. But uh, it's usually uh, transmitted between ticks and rodents in the wild. Outbreaks in humans recently, recently began when Ixodes ticks, as you know, the etiologic agent of a lot of tick-borne diseases in the northeast, including uh, Lyme disease, recently became infected with the virus. As a result, this disease is closely prevalent with Lyme disease. Generally occurs in the northeast and midwest, and there have been approximately 60 cases in the last 10 years. So this is the Oxodes tick, of course, responsible for what? What other diseases does Oxodes ticks Transmit. Lyme disease, as we mentioned, what's another one? Babesia, very good. Any others? Anybody else want to venture with any others? I think those are the two main ones, exotics, ticks, transmit. Lyme disease and Babesia. So let's remember our ticks. There are three main ticks in the U.S. that we want to remember, the exotics, ticks. And there are various stages. So this time of year, maybe um, in some of the warmer southeastern state, states, for example, um, we may be seeing a little bit of tick activity. But generally speaking, in the early t in the early spring, you see the larvae. They're extremely tiny. Look at the dime there, in comparison. And then as you go later on, you see more of the more mature ticks, from uh, nymphs to adult males to adult females. 
Now, the Ixodes tick is known as the black-legged tick. Amblyoma americanum is known as the lone star tick. Why is it called the lone star tick? Is it because it's uh, from Texas? Or is it because it has that, uh, uh, that dot on its carapace? Anybody know? Anybody care? It's for the dot, right? And then you have your standard dog tick dermacenter, and uh, um, its uh, carapace is very different. So know your ticks. And for those of you who just joined us, we are playing um, 10 lesser-known infectious disease outbreaks in game show format. So uh, I'm sorry, you can continue to play. Please put, um, get a sheet of paper from uh, one of your colleagues here and put, a through, put your answers on it, and we're going to hold them up. And if you get it correctly, you will get can candy. So nobody got that right. So, uh, Dr. Tony, what would that be called in uh, national board format? That would be called a throw-out question, right, because it's too hard. A throw-up question. <laughs> now, how about uh, Powassan, uh, the Powassan virus? Um, this is in, known as lineage 2, which is called the deer tick virus. Its incubation period, easy to remember, it's one week to one month. The usual symptoms of Powassan virus, fever, headache, vomiting, weakness, seizures, and memory loss are frequent manifestations. Encephalitis, meningitis may occur, but here's the kicker, okay? It has a 5 to 10% fatality rate. So about up to 10% or 1 in 10 persons can die from Powassan. Um, and 50% uh, may have permanent neurological symptoms. Diagnosis is with CSF IgM antibodies. You forward the sample to the CDC. There, there are no vaccines and no treatment. Can we get that door? Prevention is avoiding exposure to tick vectors. So remember, a, basically in summary, a encephalitis that it can occur in the uh, northeast and midwest has the same distribution as Lyme disease because of its association with Ixodes ticks. No vaccines and no treatment, 5 to 10% fatality. Any questions about Powassan virus? All right, we'll move ahead to our next question after we talk about this. So um, these are, this is just reflecting the 60 cases or so that have occurred since 2004. And uh, these are the states of distribution, uh, 17 cases in New York, and then you see a surprisingly large number of cases in Minnesota. Don't you know, as they say up there. All right, moving on here to question number nine. So this RNA virus that is closely related to rabies can cause a potentially fatal encephalitis in humans who have contact with bats in Australia. Is it A, Marburg, B, Nipah virus, C, Lyssa virus, D, hendrovirus, or E, coronavirus? Pick your answer. Okay. Just have just a few more seconds. All right. Hold up your answers. Who said A? Anybody said A? A? No? Okay. How many people said B? Nipah virus. Okay, I see three. C, how many people said Lyssa virus? Okay. Very good. How many people said D, hendrovirus? A couple people said hendrovirus. E, coronavirus. How many people said coronavirus? Nobody said coronavirus. Dr. Tony, what would you call this question in, uh, <laughs> according to the ports? <laughs> <laughs> I think this would be a good question because it's evenly distributed. Everybody, we had answers for everyone except for coronavirus. Dr. Vega, would you help with the candy, please? We have some awardees. <laughs> All 
All right. So how many people? Well, let's let's uh, let's see. Is it A, B, C, or D, or E? Um, let's talk about that. So again, Marburg virus, uh, closely associated phylovirus with Ebola, right? Causes uh, hemorrhagic fever in Africa. Nipah virus is associated with fatal encephalitis in Malaysia, right? Um, Hendra virus is um, named for Hendra Australia. It causes neurologic or respiratory disease. Coronavirus is the etiology agent of SARS. Our correct answer is C, Lissa virus. If you said Lissa virus, hold up your hand. Congratulations. You were correct. So let's talk about Australian bat lysivirus. Australian bat lysivirus. Australian bat lysivirus is in the Rhabdoviridae family, which is also the family for rabies, right? The only exception is in Australia, there is no rabies. Uh, this is the only Rhabdoviridae present in Australia. Australia is rabies-free. Maybe that's why they're so hyper about animal importation. Many of you heard, heard about that, they, that the, the agricultural head of Australia threatened to euthanize Johnny Depp's pet dogs when he brought them into Australia um, a couple years ago. And they actually had to be jetted out in a private jet or they were, they were going to meet their mortar coil in Australia. So Australian bat lysivirus is the one to, uh, to be scared about in Australia. There's been a limited number of confirmed cases in humans, three since 1996, but all were fatal. Australian bat lysivirus infection occurs primarily in flying foxes, also known as fruit bats, and insectivorous microbats. It's predominantly in Queensland, Australia. Those of you who are familiar with Australia, um, if not, I will show a picture. And it's a, a similar... Uh, European bat lysivirus occurs in Europe. So this is Queensland, Australia. It includes the wonderful um, towns of Brisbane. And as they say locally, and I'm going to try this, Cairns. That's how they call it. That's how they call that town. <laughs> I call it Kearns, but they call it Cairns. So um, that's Queensland, and that's where the cases were described. It's uh, in, in the northeastern part of the Australian continent and has a lot of, uh, of uh, forested areas. It's also right next to the Great Barrier Reef, great place to visit. So what about these three cases, 1996, 2012, and 2013? All developed fatal encephalitis after being bitten or scratched by bats. Cases were characterized by prolonged incubation periods, anywhere from three weeks to 27 months. Clinical manifestations are similar to rabies virus, including the development of a fatal encephalitis. Management, pre-exposure vaccination is recommended for those at highest risk. This is with the rabies vaccine. There are two uh, vaccines in Australia, a human-derived uh, um, uh, vaccine and a purified chick embryo vaccine. Obviously, you want to avoid bats in Australia. Um, diagnosis by PCR serology, and you manage it similar to that with rabies. There's no effective treatment as with rabies, and... Because it has 100% fatality, prevention is key. So this is a bat brain, um, and uh, the brown spots there are the Australian bat lysivirus. So, um, you know, uh, I could make a cheap uh, Batman pun here, but I won't. So just remember Australian bat lysivirus. Remember that Australia has no rabies. They just have this pathogen. It's relatively rare but high, highly fatal if acquired. Um, and actually, a great a subject of a great talk would be fatal diseases you can come across by traveling to Australia because there are many. Australia is a dangerous place. I think that's why um, that characterizes Australians. Do you know any Australians, Dr. Vega? You do. You do, actually. So you, I know you have conversations about that. Yes. They have big, big gun laws in uh, Australia. All right, let's move on here to um, question number eight. You are getting your burrito fix at a chain restaurant one afternoon, and then three to four days later develop abdominal cramps, fever, and, and, and bloody diarrhea. The shiga toxin producing organism responsible for a recent outbreak of a 
HUS-like syndrome in sever several Midwestern states is, is it Jack in the Box, E. coli O715, H157, excuse me, I transposed that, Taco Bell, Salmonella Hartford, Taco Bell, E. coli H7 O157, Chipotle, E. coli O26, or Cadoba, Salmonella Typhi. Okay, enter your question. You have a few more moments, please. I'm sorry I started that late. Okay, how many people said A, Jack in the Box? How many people said B, Taco Bell in Hartford? How many people said C, Taco Bell, E. coli? One, two people. How many people said Chipotle, E. coli, 0026? Several people said that. And how many people said Cadoba, Salmonella Typhi? Now, um, how many of these outbreaks are actual outbreaks? How many people say two? How many people say three? How many people say four? How many people say five? Okay. The correct, an the correct answer is all of them are actual recent outbreaks, but there's only one correct answer for the purposes of this question. So um, they're all correct outbreaks, but the correct answer is, if you've been paying attention to the news, Chipotle, E. coli 026. How many people said, raise your hand if you got that correct, and you will be receiving candy. Congratulations. So... E. coli 026. Yes. Yes. What was the etiology of the other outbreak? I know, but what is the, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, hold that thought because I actually address that in just a minute. A minute. Okay, so. In October 2015, public health authorities began investigating an outbreak of shiga toxin producing STEC 026 infections in Washington and Oregon. Most state at several Chipotle Mexican Grill locations within those states. Um, Chipotle temporarily closed its locations in those states and pledged to revise its food safety practices. The outbreak highlighted a recent history of six food safety failures the chain experienced since July 2015, including norovirus, Salmonella and E. coli. So all three of those, six outbreaks. So um, was there a common source ingredient to all the, ca in all the cases? It's not well known. The last reported case count, 53 cases, nine states, and no deaths, and 20 hospitalizations. This and an unrelated norovirus outbreak in California sent their stock reeling down 40% from its 2015 high. Um, those of us in... Uh, invest in Apple stock about the same. So I don't know if it's, uh, who'll tell me about it. So no specific ingredient has yet been identified. Stores were closed for four hours for safety training just last week. And the chain also faces a federal criminal investigation. Chipotle pledged $10 million to help farmers meet its new rigid safety protocols, one of which will be to barcode all their source ingredients so they can be traced back to the original farm, which will help them know what caused the outbreak. They use a lot of fresh stuff. They, they pledge to use highly sustainable and uh, organic and antibiotic-free stuff, so that complicates their food chain. It's kind of ironic that they, they have placed such a commitment to, um, to sourcing food that is um, better, higher quality, but yet they, they faced these outbreaks. Right. So... <laughs> I think their stock must have because it's been taken to die. Okay, so um, what is it about HUS like E. coli 026? So we've all heard about E. coli um, H70157, right? This is one of the six strains of non-0157 E. coli, including 026, 045, 0103, and so forth, that, are, that cause HUS-like symptoms. It originated in Europe, and it has a similar transmission route via, fe via fecal contamination. So it, fecal contamination causes the outbreak. So where in Chipotle's food source did, they, did, they, did their food product get contaminated by feces? Some um, strains are second only to 0157 in terms of virulence. And in some ways, this could have been worse because nobody has died yet. 
and I found this on the internet. You can't spell Chipotle without E. coli. Again, just for a disclaimer, for online purposes, that was found online. I do not personally or my, uh, my, my family or my employer believe that. Thank you. You too. Okay, so um, the important points there, be aware of E. coli 026 as being another cause of HUS-like syndrome, the association with Chipotle. And remember that um, all of the five choices there involved actual outbreaks. So be aware of food safety. It's important when you eat out. Eat out. Question number seven. This viral illness in 2014 caused a nationwide, out, nationwide outbreak of several respiratory illness of severe respiratory illness in children affecting more than 1,000 people in 49 states. The virus associated with this outbreak was A, enterovirus 68, B, enterovirus 71, C, adenovirus 14, and D, Coxsackie virus A6. So which one is it? A, B, C, or D? I left out E this time, so I give you a break. A 25% chance of being correct. Has everybody made their answer? Okay, so how many people said uh, A? If you said A, raise your hand. Enterovirus 68. Okay, we see a couple. How many people said B? Enterovirus 71. A couple people said 71. How many people said C? Adenovirus 14. Antivirus 14, raise your hand. And then D, Coxsackie virus A6. How many people said Kentucky? Everybody? Did, did you say D? Okay. All right. So, Dr. Tony, what kind of question is that considered in the board? Uh, that's like an even statistical mean type of question, right? Because everybody, we got an even distribution. But I think a little bit, a few people were tilted uh, more in one way than the other. Okay. So, let's see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is A, enterovirus 68. Enterovirus 68. Enterovirus 71 causes a similar syndrome, but it didn't cause the 2014 outbreak I'm talking about. Adenovirus 14 was associated with an uh, outbreak of pneumonia in 2008. And uh, Coxsackie virus A6 that killed people. Coxsackie virus A6 was associated, I believe, with a respiratory outbreak in China. I don't think it was associated with the U.S., so what is it? So if you got Dr. My my uh, wonderful helper, Dr. Vega, already distributing the candy even before. So thank you very much, Dr. Vega. And if we run out, we have another bag here. So, um, so what is it about enterovirus 68 that caused this outbreak in 2014? Um, it was first identified in in California in 1962. Is more than a hundred non-polio enteroviruses. Um, this outbreak caused severe respiratory illness in children and affected 1,153 people in 49 plus states with 14 deaths. So a lot of people died from this. So um, this is a, a CDC, I believe, associated chart. How does enterovirus 68 spread? It spreads easily through close contact with an infected person through oral secretions, stool, respiratory droplets, um, and those with asthma have a higher risk. Um, if you're affected by it, you obviously want to conduct some um, good personal hygiene, stay away from sick people, wash your hands, cover your coughs, clean and disinfect surfaces. It's uh, being a, a member of the picornavirus, it's closely related to other picornaviruses, including rhinovirus. Uh, I should say it's, it's closely associated with some other respiratory virus, including rhinovirus, Coxsackie virus, and poliovirus. Um, the states... Uh, that had some of the cases are listed there. And uh, um, how the, the, the cold-like symptoms uh, can, can be present sometimes in susceptible individuals. You can have prolonged symptoms of wheezing, prolonged fever, persistent vomiting, occasionally severe respiratory distress, especially in asthmatics. So um, here's a, another CDC-associated handout. Uh, advising people how to uh, prevent the spread of enterovirus D68. So these, again, um, were some of the symptoms, but an important one to mention, some children developed an acute flaccid paralysis. And that was, uh, if those of you may remember, in 2014, um, this story started out by 
um, some reports of why are these children in these certain states developing polio-like syndromes? Yes, uh, Dr. Tony. So, um, yeah, very good, very well put. So there's no specific treatment or vaccine diagnosis via the CDC, but, of course, in recent years we've had greater availability of respiratory virus detection methods in hospitals, and that may increase our awareness. Fortunately, the nationwide outbreak has not returned in 2015, so um, we've not seen enterovirus 68, but be aware it was a cause of a recent outbreak. Okay, so moving on here. In 2014, this novel tick-borne pathogen spontaneously emerged in a rural area of eastern Kansas and infected a previously healthy man who later developed fever, rash, and fatigue progressing to multi-organ failure, cardiopulmonary arrest, and death. Was this Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Bourbon virus, Heartland virus, Borrelia miyamotoi, and Ehr or Ehrlichia chaffinsis? Okay, so I'll give you a few more seconds. Which one of these? Was it uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Bourbon Virus, Heartland Virus, Borrelia, or Ehrlichia? How many people said A, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? How many people said B, Bourbon Virus? How many people said C, Heartland Virus? A couple of people said Heartland Virus. Okay. How many people said Borrelia miyamotoi? How many people said E. Ehrlichia chaffinsis? So actually this was a good question because uh, the answers were all over the map. Let's see what our survey said. Our survey said bourbon virus. I don't think anybody got that, right? Well, let's keep that in mind because... So bourbon virus, the correct answer was B. Um, I don't have a sound effect for that. Oh, that wasn't good. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, sorry, you can't please everybody all the time. So let's learn about bourbon virus. Bourbon virus is in the thagotovirus family. In, or it's a thagotovirus, rather, in the family orthomyxoviridae. And it's associated with both hard or soft ticks. It has a wide geographic distribution, but it is a rare human pathogen. And unfortunately, this nice man um, was the victim. He was previously healthy, um, over age over 50, from Bourbon County, um, Kentucky, or Kansas, rather, I'm sorry. And uh, his outdoor, he, he was aware of outdoor tick exposure with an engorged arthropod he found on his shoulder several days before he developed nausea, weakness, and diarrhea, progressing to fevers, chills, headache, myalgias, and arthralgias. Because his symptoms closely resembled a rickettsial infection, he was given doxycycline. Unfortunately, one day later, he was found obtunded and was taken to, by ambulance to a local hospital. At the hospital, he was initially pancytopenic and hyponatremic with transaminitis. So he was given IV fluids, and his doxycycline was switched to IV. He was transferred to a tertiary center, but at that time he was found to have worsening dyspnea, was intubated, and then developed shock necessitating three pressors. Um, so he developed multi-system organ failure. He was made DNR after an episode of SVT and, and pulseless electrical activity. And unfortunately, he died on day 11 of the illness. With his um, death still a mystery, his whole blood specimen was... Uh, submitted to the CDC, and it demonstrated an orthomyxovirus. And this was then named after the county for which it originated. And as a result, it became known as the Bourbon virus. So Bourbon virus has the potential to cause more widespread outbreaks, um, but whether this will occur is unknown. 
there was actually a second case in Payne County, Oklahoma in 2015. Um, fortunately, the Oklahoma patient made a full recovery unlike the original case, and the exact tick vector is unknown. So be well aware of the bourbon virus, and uh, it's unassociated with the beverage, by the way. So this is a good trivia question. Bourbon virus is not named after bourbon. It was named after Bourbon County, Kansas. <laughs> Dr. Tony asked if bourbon was protective. That is unknown, but uh, if you want to do some research, go to Kansas and stop by Kentucky and get your bourbon. <laughs> All right, question number five, and we're making horrible time. Well, I will predict that before the end of this uh, lecture, I will do that. <laughs> Where I will do that remains to be seen. Since 2013, this novel bacterial pathogen, originally identified in Russia, has caused a febrile syndrome in individuals in the northeastern U.S. associated with exposure to the Ixodes deer tick. Is it A, Rickettsia rickettsii, B, Francisella tularensis, C, Borrelia burgdorferi, D, Borrelia miyamotoi, or E, Anaplasma phagocytophilium? So which one is it? Select your choice. I'll give you a little bit more time. I realize this is... So is it Rickettsia rickettsii, Francisella? Francisella is tick-borne, of course, in some cases. Borrelia, anaplasma. So how many people said Rickettsia rickettsii? Raise your hand or indicate your answer on a piece of paper. Nobody? How many people said Francisella tularensis, tularemia? Okay, we have one Francisella. How many people said Borrelia burgdorferi, also, of course, associated with Ixodes deer ticks? How many people said D, Borrelia miyamotoi? Wow. Okay. So it's like we're making a commitment there for D. How many people said anaplasma? Anaplasma, of course. Very good. We have a couple. All right. Let's see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is D, Borrelia miyamotoi. Thank you very much. How many people got that? Raise your hands and prepare for candy. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about Borrelia miyamotoi. So this is a, a new and potentially emerging pathogen, right? The first case in North America was reported in 2013. First human cases were identified in Russia in 2011. Um, it was previously considered a non-pathogenic species, and uh, the cases that um, have occurred, have centered in the northeastern United States, um, including New England, obviously related to its association with Ixodes. So far, there have been less than 60 cases reported in the U.S. thus far. It's considered to be an emerging pathogen, and a case series was published in 2013. How many of you saw this? Published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, Borrelia miyamotoi disease in the northeastern United States, um, looking at cases. Um, there were 97 uh, BMD cases identified by, P, uh, by PCR. Um, so this is the phylogenetic Borrelia tree, and you can see um, the phylogenetically it originates in Russia, in Asia. The typical presentation is with fever, chills, headache, and myalgia arthralgias. Um, patients can get elevated liver enzyme levels, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. Um, Rash uh, was uh, not very uh, common with uh, patients with this syndrome, but uh, there can be up to a quarter of individuals hospitalized. Um, treatment with doxycycline tended to make patients better, and there were no general long-term sequelae. So if, for further information, you can check out this uh, um, publication or the, the one in uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine. Diagnosis, uh, because this is an emerging pathogen, tests are not widely commercially available, but check with the CDC to see if PCR and serology uh, may be available. And because this is uh, Borrelia that's uh, closely related to Burgdorferi, uh, serology may cross-react with Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, and as I said, successful outcomes have occurred with a two-to-four week, two -four week course of doxycycline. Amoxicillin and ceftriaxone have also been used. Prevention is avoidance of tick vectors. So again, it emphasizes this is another pathogen potentially that can occur in the same geographic areas as Lyme disease. 
All right, we're head, getting the home, heading the home stretch here. In 2014, multiple individuals in Missouri and Tennessee came down with a febrile illness accompanied by headaches, diarrhea, and fatigue. Which of the following pathogens was ultimately felt to be responsible? Was it A, lysivirus? B, enterovirus 68? C, bourbon virus? How many people are going to drink bourbon later on after work? Okay, I'm just kidding. D, Zika virus? <laughs> He'll be in Kansas by way of Kentucky. Or E, Heartland virus. Okay. Place your answers. We have a few more seconds. How many people say Lissa virus? Raise your hand if you say Lissa virus. I see many, most people were listening. <laughs> Enterovirus 68. Enterovirus 68. Bourbon virus. Zika virus or E, Heartland virus. How many people said Heartland virus? Okay, most people say the correct answer is Heartland virus. Well, I think we're going to get cleaned out of our first bag of candy here. Thank you so much. So this was Heartland virus. So this is a Flebovirus virus in the same family as Rift Valley fever in the Bunyaviridae family. First described in 2012, the exact... Vector and means of transmission are not completely known, but there's recent data that suggests an association with amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick. There it is there on the right. Eight cases were in the initial outbreak. All documented cases occurred in the what are considered the warm weather months, May through September. Most patients reported tick exposure prior to the onset of their illness. They typically had fever, fatigue, anorexia, nausea, or diarrhea, some cases, they had bone marrow sequelae or liver enzyme elevation. Many were initially misdiagnosed with Ehrlichia because of the geographic distribution, but did not initially respond to doxycycline. And there is Heartland virus there in the top left. Treatment is entirely supportive. The established diagnostic studies um, are not yet available. There's no therapy or vaccine. Most patients in the case series recovered. One elderly patient with multiple comorbidities died. And basically, prevention is avoidance of tick factors. And in this case, it's not exodes. It's amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick, with the dot on the carapace. So um, if you're in that area, uh, maybe uh, drinking bourbon, as Dr. Tony will be later. later. Be a, be, you, you know, you're not going to just worry about bourbon virus. You're going to worry about heartland virus potentially as well. If you're in the heartland, exactly. So, and that brings up a good question. Why was this named Heartland virus? Probably because that's considered the heartland of the U.S. Okay, moving on here to number three. This enteric pathogen caused a 2015 outbreak involving more than 50 persons in 16 states who had handled pet turtles. Is it Salmonella San Diego? Salmonella Munkin? Salmon, who knows how to pronounce that? Is it Munkin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Salmon, uh, Salmonella Puna. <laughs> Sorry about the typo. Salmonella enteritis, or E, -E A, and C. <laughs> yes. Be advised that that is a, what would they call that in uh, board? Lingo. That's a throw out question because there's a misspelling. So, how many people said A, Salmonella San Diego? Very good. How many people said Salmonella Munchen? How many people said Puna? How many people said Enteritis? Or how many people said A and C? A and C. Anybody A and C? Okay. All right. A couple. The correct answer is E, A and C. It is actually Salmonella San Diego, Salmonella Puna. Very good. The trouble with turtles. So how many people had a pet turtle when they were a kid? Raise your hand if you had a pet turtle. Okay. So I had a pet turtle as a kid as well. Because when I was growing up in my favorite decade, the 1970s, everybody had pet turtles. And, uh, in fact, I used to watch this show called The Brady Bunch. How many people watch The Brady Bunch? So... How many, how many people remember Herman the pet turtle and the Brady Bunch? The Brady Bunch had a turtle. They had a pet rabbit. Why couldn't I have a pet turtle? So I had a pet turtle. However, 
um, it's not a good idea. So the 2015 Salmonella San Diego Puna outbreak affected 51 people in 16 states between uh, January 22nd and September the 8th. 15 hospitalizations occurred. There were no deaths. 50% of ill persons were young children five years and younger. And epidemiologic and lab findings link both pathogens to contact with small turtles and their environment. Since 1975, in fact, small turtles have been banned as pets by the FDA because of the association with salmonella. So uh, pets are, uh, pet turtles are bad news, especially those four inches or less, and especially among very young kids. And very young kids um, seem to bond with turtles, maybe because they're small like kids are, and they're, they're cuddly, and they're cute. And because of these, uh, you know, darned uh, superhero figures that happen to be turtles. So, um, for, for your bonus question, who can name those? Yeah, who can name those two turtles? Which are they, uh, which um, tr- neoclassical painter are they? Leonardo and Michelangelo, okay. All righty. You know better than me. So what are the uh, typical symptoms associated with... Uh, Salmonellosis, of course, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, abdominal cramps. If you're an immunocompromised person or if you're an asplenic, you are at particular risk um, for complications, including disseminated disease, DIC, meningitis, prosthetic device infections, and so forth. So contact with tiny turtles from 2011 to 2013, eight multi-state outbreaks, 473 sick persons, uh, ages ranging from 1 to 94 years. I wish my mother, who's approaching being a nonagenarian, had a pet turtle. I think that they're, you know, but she, you know, but you got to be careful. So average age is 4 years old. Um, 31% were infants younger than a year old. So maybe uh, uh, a young toddler has a pet turtle and shares it with, with um, their infant um, sibling, and they got sick. Um, so contact with tiny turtles, be careful. If you buy a pet turtle from a reputable pet store or breeder, be careful. Shell lengths less than four inches have been banned. Only buy turtles with shell lengths longer than four inches. And don't toss your turtle. I actually tossed my turtle in the 1970s. I took them to a uh, turtle enclosure at Bush Gardens and, uh, and threw them in, and I feel bad about it now. But, you know, I blame the, Bra- I blame the Brady Bunch. So, and let's blame the Brady Bunch for a lot of society's ills if you grew up in the 70s. Don't you agree, Dr. Tony? <laughs> exactly. So, don't, no turtle to- tossing or no little people uh, tossing either. So, that's a good question. I, I was not able to find that in my research or my Brady Bunch watching. You are right, and that was my next slide. Snakes, lizards, and frogs can also be a source of human salmonella infections. Exactly. Dr. Tony is not a – he actually uh, – I, I set him up there to bring that up. So I can introduce my next slide. I can't think of anything more cuddly than reptiles. Right, exactly. So uh, be advised, if you're into reptiles as pets, be careful. All right, so let's move on here. we got a few more second, a few more minutes. A mutated virus derived from a live attenuated virus strain caused 24 outbreaks of a paralysis syndrome in 760 recipients in 21 countries since 2000. The vaccine was for A, measles, B, varicella, C, smallpox, D, yellow fever, E, polio. So which one of these? Uh, Each of these um, has a vaccine. And uh, um, so... Could it be measles? Is it smallpox? Smallpox vaccine has been administered in the last 10 or 20 years. Yellow fever vaccine, of course, live virus. E, polio. And I think I left out varicella as well. Dr. Tony does, knows a lot about varicella vaccine, having done some clinical trials. So let's say, did you say A? How many people said A? Measles? Measles? No? Varicella. Raise your hand if you said varicella. Okay. We have one. Smallpox, smallpox vaccine, very dangerous, a lot of side effects. Yellow fever, yellow fever vaccine is sometimes required for travel to certain countries. How many people said E, polio? A lot of people said polio. So let's see what our correct answer is. The correct answer is polio. 
So let's, uh, boy, we were going to really hand out, throw out some candy now. Dr. Vega is going to get um, uh, some muscle pain here later um, from all, all this throwing. So the reason for polio vaccine, of course, is because of um, the great um, clinical scourge, one of the, one of the uh, most impactful and devastating diseases of the 20th century, polio, especially affecting um, persons in the 1950s. And uh, um, the discovery of, of the um, oral polio vaccine was one of the great uh, technological and medical triumphs of, uh, of the 20th century as well. However, circulating vaccine-derived polio virus is a phenomenon that has been described. It occurs due to sporadic mutations of oral polio virus-related strains, and it affects people who are unvaccinated. So as you vaccinate people with oral polio virus vaccine, the unvaccinated can become susceptible to genetically mutated strains from this oral polio virus vaccine. And prior, and prior vaccine-derived poliovirus outbreaks have occurred in multiple locations over the years, including Poland in 1968, Hispaniola, more recently, um, the Philippines, or if you're Steve Harvey, the Philippians, and uh, India in 2009, and Pakistan in 2013. I'm sorry. I'm totally at fault. It was on the con. It's not a risk factor when using inactivated polio vaccine because, of course, that's inactivated. So you may think that this is a relatively rare syndrome, but in fact, these are all areas where vaccine-derived poliovirus um, outbreaks have occurred. There's even been, an, uh, an, as we mentioned, an outbreak in Hispaniola, um, 21 cases reported there. A lot of places in Africa and in uh, Asia associated with uh, polio eradication ex, um, efforts. So this is a um, table showing the differences between vaccine-derived poliovirus infection and wild poliovirus. Um, of course, vaccine-derived poliovirus is more rare, um, but it can still lead to paralysis or death. Um, it's also associated with low immunization rates, poor sanitation, and high population densities. Um, how do you stop transmission for both? More uh, poliovirus vaccination. You've got to increase immunization rates. And look at the strains. Type 2, which was eradicated in 1999, causes 90% of cases. Um, type uh, 1 and type 3 virus um, causes a relatively smaller number of vaccine-derived poliovirus um, cases. So the current oral polio vaccine is a trivalent vaccine. So what are some strategies we can do to reduce the incidence of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to increase vaccination rates because this is predominantly a phenomenon among the unvaccinated, right? The second thing you can do in the short term is switch from trivalent to bivalent oral polio vaccine. So you leave out type 2 within the vaccine, which causes 90% of the cases. Um, and then as you increase vaccination rates and you um, use a bivalent vaccine, as the um, prevalence of vaccination in the population increases to a certain level, you actually switch and end all use of oral polio vaccine. And at that point, if you just use an inactivated vaccine, um, this oral polio virus-derived infection will cease. So that's a strategy for eliminating both wild and vaccine-derived polio. Um, and again, it's reflected here um, in this slide. And I'm going to skip forward in the interest of time and go to our last question, which is the following. In which of the following Caribbean countries? This is our double jeopardy question. Uh, so everybody gets two, candy, two candies who answers correctly here. In which of the following Caribbean countries can you be exposed to dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus by the same vector, the Aedes species mosquito. This is not an easy question, but let's see who answers correctly. A, Dominica, B, Barbados, C, San Lucia, D, Grenada, or all of the above. So answer carefully. This is a final Jeopardy question. A, B, C, D, or E. How many people have been to any of these countries? Raise your, okay, where, where have you been? Dominica? 
Where you, have you been? No? St. Lucia. Okay. So you can tell us about these countries. So is it A, B, C, D, or E? Okay. So how many people said A, Dominica? A couple. How many people said B, Barbados? Very good. How many people said C, San Lucia? How many people said D, Grenada? The correct answer is Barbados. So as with our friend Rihanna, you can go there and you can get all three. So we have Rihanna could visit her relatives, and she's from Barbados, of course. Okay, so just for curiosity, so Dominica, you can get dengue and, ch and chikungunya. San Lucia, you can get dengue and chikungunya. Grenada, you can get dengue and chikungunya. But only Barbados um, is listed as uh, you're at risk for um, Zika virus. Now, that may change, of course, as Zika virus uh, has penetrance to more uh, countries in the Caribbean and the Lesser Antilles, as they, as they call them. So we've been flooded with Zika virus facts, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to breeze this through this very quickly. For those of you who didn't attend uh, Dr. Um, Gomp's Grand Rounds last week and, uh, uh, and Dr. Pasakova's Grand Rounds at Moffitt um, earlier on last week, single-strand and RNA virus, flavivirus, transmitted via the Aedes mosquito, Human and non-human primates are the main reservoirs. Four means of transmission, perinatal and utero transfusion and sexual transmission. 80% of infections are asymptomatic. Those are the common symptoms. A uh, major concern, of course, is microcephaly. So if you read the Daily Mirror in London, you may come up with this headline, shrunken head virus, don't get pregnant. There's a sex alert. <laughs> and by the way, I'm, I was happy to hear about Phil Collins, so... <laughs> this is uh, microcephaly, um, and the reason why there was so much concern about Brazil because of the spike in microcephaly cases compared with typical number in 2015. Pregnant women advised to avoid Zika virus areas, but as we, may, as we will soon see, that isn't the major problem, right? We'll see that in just a second. So I went ahead and uh, put together this slide, which shows you some distinctions between Zika, dengue, and chikungunya. In particular... Um, Zika virus more likely to be associated with microcephaly, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis, dengue, high fever, intense headaches, and the dengue hemorrhagic fever syndrome. Chikungunya, um, the word chikungunya meaning that which bends up. There's just bent over with severe pain, strong joint pains, and muscle aches. How Zika virus spread? It was first uh, documented in Uganda in a rhesus monkey. Um, subsequently identified in 1952 in Uganda and Tanzania, and it just had this inexorable spread um, farther east. Um, cases in Malaysia in 1966, cases in Pakistan, India, Malaysia, and Indonesia in the 70s, first major outbreak in Polynesia um, in 2007, and then spread eventually to Brazil, and then populating um, the Caribbean and uh, the Americas. And uh, these are all um, cities with greater than 1,000 travelers from Brazil from September to August 20, September 2014 through August 2015. So there's a lot of travel from South America to Central and North America, so it's inevitable that um, we'll have imported cases and eventual locally transmitted cases. Sexual transmission reported February 2nd. First case of Zika virus having been locally acquired in the U.S., involving sexual transmission between the patient and someone who recently traveled to Venezuela and acquired the virus there. There's no risk to a fetus, and only two previous cases of sexual transmission were ever documented prior to that. So, prevention through avoidance of the mosquito vector. Um, there was a CDC travel advisory January 15th recommending pregnant women or those anticipated getting pregnant consider postponing travel to affected areas. No specific antiviral treatment, no vaccine is available, supportive treatment, rule out common at dengue or chikungunya vaccine infection, especially if you travel to Barbados. So what is the latest? I pulled all these headlines up today. So the FDA advises against blood donation by recent travelers this week to Zika-prone areas and their sexual partners. The World Health Organization requested 
56 million dollars to back up, battle Zika virus for vaccines, diagnostics, and research. So here's the kicker. See, there was an there was a article on CNN um, today that um, when female Olympian athletes um, say that they don't want to re- travel to Brazil, there was a recent article about Hope Solo, the U.S. women's soccer goalie, saying she doesn't want to travel there. Um, Dr. William Schaffner from uh, um, ten- from Tennessee, from uh, Nashville, mentioned that the real issue is with men. Now, why is that? It's because women can clear can be infected before they become pregnant and clear the the virus. There's no evidence that shows that women um, maintain a a continuous or chronic infection and that once the infection clears, it's safe for them to become pregnant. Men, however, it's not really known once they become infected how long the virus will persist in semen. So if if Hope Solo's husband... Um, goes with her to the Olympics in Brazil, and he becomes exposed, there's no current guidance that says how long they need to practice um, barrier methods of contraception before she can become pregnant, if she wishes to become pregnant afterwards. There's no guidance about that. It may be that Hope Solo's husband needs to use condoms indefinitely until um, it more knowledge is available to know how long it, it or when it is exactly it's safe for men who are exposed to um, not practice contraception. So the very interesting phenomenon. Uh, there's another story. Could a mosquito larvicide be responsible for microcephaly cases in Brazil? The larvicide is called piriproxifen, and at least one Brazilian state has banned its use. And the debate continues whether the 2016 Rio Olympics should be called off. So as, as of now, it's still ongoing, full speed ahead. So my conclusion, and thank you all for staying late, be aware of infectious pathogens that are under the radar. Now, I included Zika virus, even though it's very much over the radar, but six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, it would have been totally under the radar. Again, until diseases infect us here in the U.S., in many cases, and it's sad to say we could care less. Many resources for emerging infection awareness, CDC website, World Health Organization, Emerging Infectious Disease Journal, ProMed Mail, and others. And that is my talk, and thank you all very much.